Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the BetaShares webinar series. My name is Blair Modica. It's great to be with you today, and apologies for the delay in, in bringing this session to you. Uh, apparently, the New York City traffic's leading up to its reputation and has made our guest uh, a little late today, but he's here and ready to go. And we look forward, we're looking forward to talking all things uranium and especially the looming supply shortage. So excited to, to have a conversation today and, and really look forward to, uh, to what's in, in store for us. Just before we get started, the information contained in this presentation, as always, is general information in nature doesn't uh, constitute personal financial advice. And if you are seeking personal financial advice, please seek out a qualified financial planner. Before we start again, as always, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. So a recording of this session and the slides will be sent to you this afternoon. We've left lots of time at the end for questions. So please use the toggle, type in your question at any stage and we'll endeavour to get through as many as we can at the, end of, uh, at the end of proceedings. Just very briefly on beta shares, you can see there we have the widest range of ETFs available on the ASX and now managing around 22 billion in funds under management. Perhaps the, the most important part of this slide is, is just letting you know that we are the only Australian founded and, and managed ETF provider and that's particularly interesting on a couple of key points. One, all of our funds are designed and, and managed in Australia, which means we're able to bring you the most relevant product for, for our particular nation's needs. And the other thing about that is because all of our funds are designed in Australia, they're also domiciled in Australia. And that means there's no need for any type of paperwork when investing overseas, W8 Ben forms. It's all as you see it and you're able to trade and, and use that ETF without any, any sort of a uh, you know, nasty paperwork. So today it's it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Tim Rotolo, who's uh, the CEO of North Shore Indices. So Tim really leads the investment process and is responsible for all company activities and has been involved in several successful financial ventures in the past. So welcome today, Tim. Let's, let's get into it. Uh, Uranium certainly come into its own as an investment option over the last couple of years. So Maybe let's start with an overview of what we're running through today, and I'll, I'll just hand over the uh, the controls to you now. Sounds great. Thanks, Blair. Thanks, everybody, for uh, bearing with me and, and my travel difficulties. So what I think I'm going to do, um, I'm, I'm going to switch the agenda up a little bit. I'm, I want to I want to highlight just some of the historical context for how we got to where we are today, and then we'll talk about the role of nuclear in, an, in a decarbonizing economy, and then how that's effectively turned into a potential renaissance for nuclear energy, something that I never thought I would see uh, when we first started this process of, of launching North Shore Indices and URNM in the United States. So let's flip to slide, hang on. Hang on, Blair, I'm having a little bit of difficulty with the slide. All right, Tim, can you, do you have control now? Hmm. Not working, that's all right, I can, I can flick for you if you like. Yeah, if you could, if you could flip to uh, slide 15. No problems. Nuclear gold and, uh, great. So I think, it's, I think when you think about the thesis for uranium, it's really important. Uh, you can go one more down, please. Yep, perfect. It's it's really important important to remember where we came from because a lot of the opportunity is a function of a multi-year bear market that this uh, that this asset class really uh, experienced. And so when when you think about nuclear energy and the idea that there's a renaissance occurring and a and a potential bull market in uranium. You really have to put in the context of what happened from in the 2000s and then ultimately with Fukushima and then over the preceding decade, a lot of which we're seeing play out in Europe um, and their, their move away from nuclear power post Fukushima. But so pre, pre Fukushima, uh, you, you had a huge bull market in uranium from basically 04 to 07. The price of uranium went from $10 to 147. The number of companies ballooned to about 500. There's about $150 billion of market cap created. 
And then almost overnight, uh, when Fukushima occurred and 54 reactors were taken offline in Japan, demand collapsed. And so you actually saw that that number from 150 billion of market cap went to as low as 5 billion in 2018. Number of companies that called themselves uranium mining businesses went from 500 to 50. It was just an absolute decimation. Sentiment was so negative. And that's basically when we saw Europe and, and I would say the globe really move away from nuclear power, um, which obviously was reinforced by you know, Putin and, and the shale revolution. Um, there was a real rationale for why we should move away from nuclear. It was so dangerous. Look what happened in Fukushima. Although Fukushima, when you really look at the details, was not a particularly deadly event. It was a freak outlier event. Um, and actually in some ways has helped to reinforce the safety record of nuclear power since then. There's been a huge push to make sure that all of these existing reactors are safe. And so what that did is that created an opportunity in the uranium space. And again, one important, very different um, differential fact about uranium is it's not purchased in the same way that oil and gas are or coal. It's not purchased in these you know, spot transactions. They're generally entered into uh, the utilities, who are the primary buyer of nuclear uh, of, of uranium, excuse me, um, they enter into multi-year contracts. And so from 04 to 07, there was a huge contracting cycle that occurred. And then those 10-year contracts basically took the miners into the mid uh, 2015, 2016, 2017. And so even though demand had collapsed in Japan and the price of uranium fell from 147 at its peak down to about 75 pre-Fukushima, all the way down to $18 um, in, in 2016. There's no supply response, as you would think there would be with other commodities. And that is a function of the, the structure of the market with these long-term contracts. But it's also the reason why we're so bullish today, because we think that those contracts have now rolled off and we need to enter into a new contracting cycle, except the backdrop is so, so much more bullish. And we can talk through all of those reasons now. Um, where if you could just, let me see actually if I can get- uh, Yeah, have a look, Tim, because I think I've fixed it. Yeah. Yep. Yep, there we go. So where we are today is in a completely different place for nuclear power. And much of that has to do with the overall energy backdrop that the world is experiencing. What, what we're, uh, let me flip to these. So I think everyone at this point is familiar with this idea that global governments realize we have to decarbonize. The problem is, I think there's been a big disconnect about the idea of decarbonizing and the practical reality of that. And the practical reality is that you need base load power. Wind and solar are intermittent sources of power. And one of the huge benefits of nuclear that was lost in the fear mongering was that it is carbon free or very low carbon. It, yes, it produces waste um, that, that, that needs to be stored, but that is a highly, highly regulated part of the nuclear power production process. So nuclear and gas to some extent, but today we're just gonna focus on nuclear, is reliable base load power. It has a very high capacity factor. And yes, there are detractors. It is a very expensive upfront cost to build a nuclear power plant. And historically, one of the arguments against it has been that you know, particularly in the United States and the West, nuclear power plants were built over budget, took twice as long, and so they were not cost competitive. But now when you look at the attempts to decarbonize and the options that are available to global governments, nuclear power is beginning to be realized as, as you know, potential center point of the entire decarbonization process. And that is because, again, it's clean, it's safe, it's arguably one of the safest forms of power, although the media would, would have you believe, uh, believe otherwise. It's baseload and it has very high capacity factors. So it's always on, always delivering, 
even in the most challenging weather conditions, nuclear power runs at 90 plus percent, which also means that from a space perspective, so this is one of the things that, nu that wind and solar uh, proponents fail to mention, is that wind and solar are cost competitive, except when you think about the fact that a nuclear power plant can last 60 years, 80 years now. And this is the part of the bull market uh, and, and the global renaissance for nuclear power today, is that these are incredibly long-lived assets. And when you start to compare the costs of something that has to be replaced every 20 years, like wind and solar, to something that could be in place for 80 years, the, the cost differential just shrinks dramatically. So that's one of the reasons why we're so excited. We think that nuclear power in particular has an, has an opportunity to be the center point of the global decarbonization process. So let's talk about where we actually are um, and then how that translates into a you know, potentially massive bull market for uranium. So again, you'll see, and I'll make a point, when, when, when I first got involved in uranium, our base case was zero to 1% demand growth. We essentially assumed that you know, 10 to 20 reactors in the United States were going away. Europe was gonna see a huge reduction in reactors. So this 434 number of operational reactors, we thought that, that number was gonna go you know, sub 400. And even then, there was a supply deficit forming in our opinion. And a lot of that has to do with this contracting cycle. And it has to do with the fact that the price of uranium was so low for so long that no mines were built. And the production economics were such that materially higher prices were going to be needed. But fast forward to today, we've seen a significant renewed interest in not only extending the life of reactors, which is maybe one of the most efficient ways to add capacity, is to just not shut them down. We're seeing this particularly in the United States, um, but also other parts of the globe. So the United States has been very interesting um, just as you know, as, as an American citizen, we have recently provided significant tax credits to existing nuclear power plants to keep them on, to make them cost competitive with wind and solar. Um, some of the most divisive states around nuclear power, California in particular, is now talking about keeping over, open uh, a very large reactor called Diablo Canyon. So you're just seeing this huge shift in sentiment as people, you know, deal with rolling blackouts, um, which, you know, is something you, you can think about, you know, for third world countries, not, you know, supposedly, the, you know, a great economy like America. Um, but even in places like France, we're starting to see renewed interest in not only not shutting down reactors, but building more. The UK, building more. And so we're seeing that in actual now just it's not just politicians talking right it's actual policy initiatives so again this production tax credit for the in, in the us is huge funding a huge and actually you can go on twitter you can go on the department of energy in the united states website and you can look at the amount of support they're putting behind advanced nuclear reactors pushing forward companies like new scale um, which was inside of a big construction conglomerate called Floor. That company is now public. That is something I never thought I would see. Um, again, China, significant advancements of their nuclear power plants in all of their five-year plans. They're talking about building eight to 10 reactors every year. And unlike in the West, they have really done a great job at developing the construction process. So they're on time, on budget, and they can reproduce these these reactors at a very rapid clip. European Union, the EU has actually added nuclear power and gas as part of their taxonomy, which allows nuclear power to get financing, a green financing. Again, unheard of, you know, three, four years ago. And, and this is only going to accelerate with what's happening with Nord Stream, right? And, and the EU energy crisis that's occurring right now there is going to be a renewed interest in developing nuclear power to try and offset higher fossil fuel prices. And Japan you know, has gone full circle from Fukushima uh, in 2011 and is now significant government to sort of support to not only 
reopen but build new reactors. And they're attempting as, as much as they can uh, to accelerate the restart. And you, again, they're importing LNG from around the world at sky high prices. So we're not talking about, yes, it's bad for the consumer, but it's also bad for their overall economy. I mean, just look at what's happened to the euro. Um, a lot of that can be attributed to not only high inflation, but you know, a significant energy crisis that's occurring in these countries. So then how does that impact uranium? Just flip to, oops. So obviously uranium is a commodity. One of the great things about commodities is you can relatively easily predict supply and demand. Nuclear power, which is the primary source of demand for, for uranium, is quite easy to predict because it's so uh, such a long lived process, right? It's, these are multi-year, sometimes multi-decade construction processes and planning processes by governments. What we're seeing now is because of all of the renewed interest in nuclear power, demand growth has accelerated to almost 5%. But at the same time, you haven't seen a material contracting cycle the way that we did in 2004 to 2007. Now this year will probably be the best contracting year in the last decade. And you're starting to see that reflected in price, right? So it'd be very different if I was sitting here and the price of uranium was still $18 like it was in 2016, but the price has moved from six, from basically 18 up to about $50 today. And the equities are starting to reflect that as well. But the reality is, in our view, you still need materially higher prices. And in 2018, 2019, we thought that price might be $60. Due to inflation and just the, the elongation of this cycle and how long it's taken for new mine developments to occur, we think that price has now moved up closer to 90 to maybe even $100. Um, so that's, that's where we are today. We, we think there's a very large supply deficit that, form, that has formed. There's a, a kind of a, a nuanced concept um, that, that's a function of the en enrichment and conversion process that we think potentially adds further demand growth um, and, and exacerbates the supply deficit even more. But the bottom line is there is a supply deficit that's formed. Nuclear power demand growth is accelerating um, you know, at, at multi-decade highs, and we, you know, we think the price of uranium needs to move up materially, you know, almost double from today's levels, and that should be very positive for the underlying equities. So, Blair, I can leave it there, um, and, and we can walk through the index if, if that makes sense. Yeah, fantastic, Tim. Thanks for that overview. I think, you know, very, very interesting things happening in the uranium space at this point in, uh, point in time. Um, and you, you sort of put the case for succinctly and, and, and well put together. So thank you for that. What I might do now is just run through the, the product that we've put together in, in the form of the ticker code URNM. So URNM provides exposure to leading global companies involved in the mining exploration, development and production of uranium also modern nuclear energy um, or, or companies that hold physical uranium or uranium royalties. So if you look on screen there, the country allocation is probably a little bit different to what you might see from a typical ETF in Australia. It gives you some, gives you some diversification from a country point of view. I know there's a, there's a fair bit of Canada in there, there's Kazakhstan, there's obviously Australia, but then you know Britain and, and some other, other countries there as well. You're looking at 37 different constituents. Now, of that top 10, you might be familiar with Paladin, um, but there's also some others there that you, you may have heard of, you may not have, you know, Yellow Cake uh, and these types of businesses. The management cost there 69 basis points, so $69 for every $10,000 invested. Um, and it really gives you that cost effective type of exposure to that nuclear energy thematic. So something we've brought to market because we think one it's a little bit different from what's out there um, and, and two allows you to play a pretty exciting space in the form of uranium with that you know form of technology which really can in a way help us solve some of those base power load issues that that are going on as tim said uh, across the world and, and rolling blackouts and these sorts of things are 
obviously something that's not good for the economy, but it's also not not good for us just in terms of being able to live, go about our daily lives. So again, becomes quite important from that point of view. Tim, we spoke earlier just about the index methodology and, and certainly for URNM. I know North Shore's the selection party responsible yeah. for identifying the companies um, and you're probably best placed to speak to that. So I'll bring you in here. The companies obviously have to derive a significant portion of their revenue from uranium to be included in the portfolio. But what else should we be looking at in terms of how we're, we're picking the securities within this fund? Sure. So you know, at the highest level, our focus is trying to provide a, a pure play but diversified product. And so what we're looking for is companies that we believe have a high likelihood of um, you know, coming into production or you know, actually producing uranium. Um, so there's, there's less on the exploration side. It tends to be companies that have existing uranium resources. Um, and so we are you know, really doing kind of a fundamental bottoms up analysis of those companies. We're not so focused on some of the you know, more traditional 50% you know, of revenue. And, and the other challenge is the uranium sector is such that there's only a, company, a, a couple of companies that actually generate revenue. Um, so we, we really need to understand which which those companies um, you know have have a good shot at putting something into production. From there, it goes to a market capitalization weighted uh, methodology. And then one of the unique things that that we tried to do um, because we feel like the, you know the central thesis is there's a supply deficit, physical uranium prices need to double, and there's a couple proxies out there who actually own physical uranium. Um, and so we think those are lower lower volatility options uh, to to you know being invested in the space, but they give you kind of one to one correlation uh, to the price of uranium. So if those go up, so let's just say those go to you know those can double in price, the equity should have more upside participation. Um, but even in down times, the physical uranium provides a little bit of a ballast and reduces the volatility, um, which again allows us to focus more of that other uh, portion of the, the weighting on some of the smaller miners. So we have a little bit lower market capitalization focus than some of the other indexes out there. Um, so we wanted to have that trade-off of, you know, the lower volatility physical uranium, but have a larger weighting and then more of the uh, junior miners and the developers, um, which can really move when the sector starts to, to, start to, starts to appreciate. Thanks. I mean, that's a really good overview and it just sort of shows the thought that we can now put into building some of these ETFs. Yep. Obviously looked at in, in, in general as market capitalization weighted indices, but we do take a lot of thought on the background in terms of how we can best build an index and include, you know, businesses that are the, the future of a particular industry. And I think, you know, that overview certainly speaks towards the index we put together here and um, and what it's, you know, capable of giving you as a as a uranium exposure just wanted to highlight uh some performance figures just just as um you know uh, backgrounding against the wider market in general so you can see like the wider market volatility has crept into the sector over over the course of this year and certainly you know is traditionally a volatile index but on a long run projection there's been significant growth over five years you can see that three month figure of uh, around 22% in terms of positive performance. A couple of reasons why. On the 6th of July, the EU Parliament voted down a proposal to exclude nuclear uh, power stations from the EU green, uh, green taxonomy. Uh, and that means that, um, or taxonomy, I should say, uh, that means nuclear energy can now be recognised as green across Europe. So you can see quickly that that's pretty significant for uranium in general. And then over in the States, the Senate passed the Inflation Reduction Act on the 7th of August. The goal of the act is to control inflation, but also increase energy security. So there's about $369 billion in spending on energy and climate. And there's a, a, a quite a few provisions in there that support nuclear energy or the base case for nuclear energy. So again, some price movement off the back of that has pulled back a little bit um, off those highs, but certainly something to consider that potentially governments in Europe, um, the US and all over the world uh, are certainly looking at nuclear as a, as a viable option going forward to be able to, uh, to, to solve some power issues. That ends the formal proceedings for the webinar today. So 
Of course, I'd like to highlight the risks associated with investing. As I said at the start of the presentation, we will make these slides available and certainly would uh, you know, give, give you the consideration to have a look at the, the investment risks of all funds, but this fund as well. Um, and we will make that available to you at the course of this afternoon. Now I wanted to flick to some questions and give us a couple of minutes just to poll them together. But in the meantime, I did want to put a poll or a couple of polls out there just in terms of what the, the audience is thinking today in terms of uranium price and, um, and other things. So I'm going to put that up on the screen right now. Give us a couple of minutes. We'll start tallying some questions as they come through and, uh, and we'll get back with you in a couple of minutes. And I should say, if, if you can't see that on screen, where do you see the uranium price at the end of 2023? And we can see a lot of votes coming in now. So again, we'll, we'll leave it up for a minute and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you the answer to that. And you can see the poll results there. I mean, interesting split, about 30% each, just with 50 to 60 US dollars, 60 to 70, and uh, and 70 above. So uh, a bit of a split in consensus in where the uh, the price of uranium is going. Um, but but interesting to to see everyone's opinion there. The other one we wanted to ask in terms of uh, I guess just general trivia. When was the first commercial nuclear power plant commissioned? So again, I'll just give you a minute there to uh, to have a look at that, give the answer, and then um, and then we'll hit into the more formal questions. And it looks like the majority of people in this forum, at least, are very well versed with uh, their, their commercial nuclear power plants. So 44% of you were right. 1954, the world's first commercial nuclear power station uh, called a hall at Windscale in England was connected to the national power grid. So um, yeah, well done there. Very, very good work on, on getting that right, if you did get that right. Um, and then just Look, moving into the, the less formal part of the presentation, just some question and answer here for you, Tim, if that's okay. There's been a number of questions that have come in, so thank you everyone for uh, for placing them and, and some really good questions as well. We may not be able to get to all of them, but uh, we will endeavour to uh, to get them to you as we can. So Tim, if you're still with us, just what, so, what growth is expected in demand of the uranium market over the next five years um, regarding mining and exports so i'm not sure whether you, you can answer that question fully but i guess just just in in your view where are you seeing the growth expected and um and, and what does that look like over a five-year period sure so i i guess i would frame it slightly differently i mean i think where we see the growth is in nuclear power demand right which is in this kind of like three to five percent range um you know there, there will need to be production growth globally um you know, it's, it's not entirely clear where production will ultimately come from. There's several mines at different stages um, that, that could try and fill the deficit. There's also some, um, so there's some existing mines, you know, like, like at Paladin's Langer Heinrich, um, which is slated to come back online at some point. 
in, in the future. Um, but you know, Australia, Canada, uh, Africa are, are, are certainly the primary uh, places where, where we would expect there to be new production growth. It's just difficult to tell. You know, if I could have if someone could tell me, um, you know, with with the crystal ball, what the price of uranium would be, I could probably better tell you where it's most likely for that uh, for that uranium to come from. But I would say, you know, on the positive side, as I pointed out there is a significant growth in contracting. And one of the more nuanced points if, is if you look at what's happened historically um, in bull markets in, for uranium, it tends to be that the utilities over contract. So they went through a period of under contracting. So if their needs are you know, 100%, um, you know, for the last decade, they've contracted 30 or 40% of those needs. And they've found other avenues to fill, you know, their their uh, uranium uh, requirements, whether it's in the spot market or carry trades, um, you know, buying excess uranium from from other parties. In the last cycle, they were actually contracting it well over 100% of their needs. And so our expectation is because the focus tends to be on security of supply, and because the price of uranium is, is effectively a de minimis portion of their operating costs, they're price insensitive. And so even if prices were to double, they would still be willing to contract. And I think what the Ukraine-Russia crisis has identified is that there is a rigidity and a weakness to the, the entire market, and that these utilities, particularly Western utilities, are now more concerned than ever that they won't be able to access supply and have sufficient uh, nuclear power, or excuse me, uranium for their power plants. And so, um, kind of a long-winded answer, but you know, obviously we expect nuclear power growth to continue, and uh, you know, uranium production growth should should follow as more contracts are signed and new mines are brought online. Thanks, Tim. And then, I guess the the other question that that a lot of people are asking in in the questions bar. So just you know, um, putting that into a more simplified text. The key risks to the uranium thesis, in in your yeah. view, in our, in our mind, it's always a nuclear power event, some type of meltdown, Fukushima, Chernobyl. Um, you know what what we've been seeing in in Ukraine obviously has created some headline risk. Um, you know, with with uh, the Russians, you know, lobbing missiles and and, uh, and and bombs at the nuclear power plant in Ukraine and it being taken offline, um, you know, you never want to see that in, in the headlines. And actually the first night when it was, uh, the first night it was bombed, um, you know, the stocks were down 25, 30%. And so that's our expectation is if you see some sort of nuclear meltdown, um, you know, whether it's real or not, there's going to be a knee jerk reaction. Uh, we're less concerned about other types of technologies you know a lot of folks point to thorium or um you know other uh, you know using re-enriched tails right so like the waste that's produced from uranium there's some discussion of whether or not that can be commercialized um, most of those types of theses that that could derail uranium as as the primary source for nuclear power are so far out in the future. Obviously, you know, another one would be fusion. Um, you know, would love to see that happen for humanity, but but the reality is, you know, fusion has always been two decades away. So we're less concerned about kind of technological obsolescence and, and more concerned about um, man-made disasters or uh, worse, the weaponization of nuclear power because it does have tremendous uh, headline impact. So, you know, whether it's a false flag event in, in Ukraine or, you know, the Russians intentionally bombing um, a reactor, obviously those would be very bad for the thesis. Absolutely. Uh, changing tax. Sorry, sorry, point out, Blair, I apologize. Those, sorry, are, was that extreme, those are very, those are extreme tail events, right? Absolutely. You know, I, I think we put a very low probability on something like that ever occurring. Obviously, the UN and the IAEA has done a phenomenal job of uh, dispelling a lot of the 
fear mongering that news outlets have attempted to do around, particularly around the Ukraine power plant, um, which is great to see. And so I think one of the benefits of having uh, such rapid communication channels like Twitter is these things get dispelled very quickly and cooler heads prevail, but that doesn't rule out, you know, some, you know, sub 1% event occurring. It just, again, that's just the nature of nuclear power, unfortunately. No, and I think it's important to, to sort of highlight that as a tail risk event. Um, changing tact a little bit in terms of geography, I mean, what, what countries have the largest deposits of uranium um, as a percentage of the total known? Is is that something we have a you know an accurate grasp on? Is there more we think that's out there in, in, in different undiscovered parts of the world? Or, or how, how do you see that? So, yeah, you know, I'd probably reframe it. I mean, you know, Australia has a tremendous amount. There, there's, there is an abundance of uranium. So uh, Australia, Canada, Kazakhstan, Russia, Namibia, there is a tremendous amount. The challenge is the price at which that uranium can be extracted from the ground. Right. And so that is where kind of the rubber meets the road, for lack of a better term. Um, and, and why we think prices need to rise is that even in Kazakhstan, the, the production economics for their type of mining, which benefits from not only a very low currency price, but much less regulation around safety. So they're the lowest cost producers in the world in Kazakhstan. They have a separate issue, which is they're kind of in the middle of the Ukraine-Russia crisis now, um, and they're having trouble getting the uranium out of, um, out of Kazakhstan and to Western parties, uh, which, which is another reason why we think prices rise probably more than they would have three or four years ago. Um, but you still have to be able to build a mine and run a company. And so those prices, you know, in, even though I'm sure in like Mongolia or um, uh, in, in certain parts of Russia, which are very remote, there's huge amounts of uranium, but you, have, you still have to build a mine there, right? Even, even in certain parts of Canada, there's tremendous resources like NextGen's Arrow, which is a prolific resource, but it's a very difficult place to build a mine. And so, you know, abundance does not equal um, economical, put it that way. Um, and, and, and a perfect example of that is, is like Cigar Lake, which is one of Cameco's mines. That mine may never return its cost of capital. And it took 20 plus years to build. So that's, that's the other challenge, I think, you know, just thinking about uranium as a longer, more secular theme. Histori historically, it's been a very cyclical, um, you know, boom bust industry. But because the last bull mar bear market was so long, and now you have this added demand growth, what, what's happened is basically the whole uh, sector has been hollowed out in terms of intellectual capital, you know, investment in infrastructure to build these projects. That when these mines are ready and there's the prices are high enough, they still have to build them. They still have to permit them, um, and so it's it's just it's a it's a very challenging industry to build these mines in. Um, and again, that, that's why we just think prices end up going well past you know, the marginal cost of production. Interesting. And then I assume that's that's the base case for the supply shortages. It's yes. difficult to to build the mines. Is there anything you'd add there? Well, it's, it's, it's difficult and it's the price has been so low for so long that these many of these projects were not advanced, right? So even the, the most advanced projects still require much higher prices. And, you know, these companies are still, the management teams are still rational actors. They're not going to advance a project at $30 uranium that requires $90 uranium. They're just, they're gonna wait for prices to get closer to where they are. Now, again, that's part of the contracting cycle. Like we're starting to see contracts signed at much higher prices than where 
the spot price is. So there was like a, a nearly $60 um, per pound contract signed the other day for a mine that needs to get developed. But again, that mine still needs to get developed and they could run into issues, right? It's, it, it's not like a, a simple process to build a mine. Even, even once it's financed, you still have to build it. Like during the last cycle when Cigar Lake was being built, it flooded twice. So, you know, there, there will always be these unexpected issues that pop up that, that cause prices to, you know, react. Right, and so we're, we're almost at time, Tim, but maybe just one more. I know we covered it um, briefly in the presentation, but just in terms of government and governmental initiatives um, that are in place to support the uranium industry at this point in time, any any commentary there um, or, or what it's likely to look like in the future? Yeah, so, I mean, I would highlight that the uranium industry remains kind of the, uh, the outlier, critical mineral. So it's it's not, so in the US there's a, there's this actual list called the critical mineral, minerals list. It's not on there. So uranium is actually not getting support. Nuclear power is getting phenomenal support. But I think one of the things that we look at a lot is there is a trend towards resource nationalization. So whether it's, you know, Chile with copper or, um, you know, China and, and rare earths, right? Other countries are now realizing that, you know, or the DRC with cobalt, right? The, the world is coming to a realization that globalization was, was great, right? It's very deflationary. But what it did is it, it put a lot of very important materials in the hands of people who may not be our, our best friends, right? Perfect example within the nuclear power uranium conversation is enrichment and conversion of uranium into nuclear fuel rods, which is heavily controlled by the Russians. That's very problematic today. So I do think that there will be increasing amounts of support around the world for uranium production to supply um, those countries who have significant nuclear power sources. So they they have their own domestic production. The United States is a perfect example. We produce 20% of our electricity from nuclear power. We're the biggest consumer of uranium globally, 50 million pounds. How much do you think we produce domestically? No idea. Just say yes. 10 million. Zero. There you go. Yeah. So the United States has a, like, a serious problem. Obviously, we're allies with Australia and Canada. But when you start to think about the potential pinch point of not having your own supply of something that produces, you know, it, it, you know like the US government has been very um, aggressive about sanctions around semiconductors, right, for China. So our, we, 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 I do think that there will be this move towards being very supportive of uranium over time and uranium mining and, you know, developing resources in countries to support their own domestic production for their own nuclear power. But that's going to take time. Again, we're at the infancy of this bull market. Um, you know, price started to react in 2018, but... You know, as, as I've said to several investors, the, the nuclear power renaissance concept is three or four months old. A, a year ago, nuclear was still hated. You know, it was only with the crisis globally around fossil fuel prices that everyone woke up to this idea that nuclear power was you know, potentially a, a, a savior, right? Or at least a bridge. That, that's the other thing I think is important to realize. Nuclear power represents a tremendous opportunity to bridge us to a decarbonization, decarbonized economy using other types of non-fossil fuels, whether it's hydrogen, um, you know, other types of gas or wind and solar. But 
I think it's recognized that nuclear, more than maybe anything, re represents the potential to get us to that next phase. Because again, the governments who decided to decree we were going to decarbonize didn't understand the practical reality that you can't just switch off fossil fuels, particularly fossil fuels that haven't had any CapEx for the last decade and are in supply shortages, right? Because it's not just uranium, it's natural gas, oil. Mm. There, there's, there's not enough supply of any of these things. And then, oh, don't forget about like copper and lithium and cobalt, which you also need for decarbonization. They're also in short supply. So at least with nuclear power, we can get ourselves from point A to point B. So we have enough time to figure out some of those other critical components. And uranium is right at the center of this because it too has not had any capital expenditure for the last decade and is now, you know, again, we, we thought there was a supply shortage when uh, supply, when, when nuclear power demand growth was zero to 1%. So, you know, at four to 5% and growing, uh, we just think there's a fantastic opportunity and, and having a diversified way to play it through the index in our view is the best, best way to go about it. Fantastic, Tim. Thank you for that response and, and for your time today. That's all we really have time for. And I think, you know, we're, we're right at time. So, you know, I'd like to just, you know, again, extend a, a warm thank you for, for making the time today. I think it's been very insightful and, and certainly given us a lot of food for thought in terms of the, the uranium base case over the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years as, as a um, ability to harbour nuclear energy. So thank you for that. I do also have to send out an apology. In the poll, I think I said 1954, I got a little bit tongue-tied. I meant 1956 was the answer to the first commercial nuclear power plant. So apologies for that. Um, but once again, thank you everyone for joining today. It's um, It's been a, a really good session, I think. Um, and we certainly, as I said before, we'll, we'll make the presentation available later this afternoon. If you do have any further um, questions or, or would like to circle back and, and see some of the insights. So we'll leave it there today, but thank you very, very much and have a good day. Thanks for your time.